So let's start today and uh, I think I should give a brief introduction again about our authors today. A very brief uh, those for those who haven't been here before and uh, who, ha who does not know. Um, Baldev Ji is uh, serving uh, the community since 1990, I think. Inka community center jo hai, usse inki shuruaat hui. Aur mera khayal hai ki usse bhi pehle aap bohat zyada engage rahe, lekin officially uske andar. Uh, health services mein bohat kaam hai, uh, institution development mein bhi bohat kaam hai, youth ke saath bhi bohat kaam hai. Mera khayal hai, as we will... As we will start our talk, we'll come across his philosophical ideas, which I really like when he talks about the problem of contemporary world and South Asians. He has a huge contribution, which I don't have words to even express that how deeply he is involved in all that. Unke saath tashreef rakhti hai Anuba Mehta ji. She is um, she is a writer, a Canadian author. Uh, literature mein kaam karti hain, literature ke saath rehti hain, judi vi, aur unka uh, Peacock in the Snow. This was the book which was released. Um, uh, I think, um, I don't exactly remember the year, but I interviewed her in TAG TV for that book. Right after that, she went to Literary Fest in uh, Jaipur also. She has the understanding of the contribution and three generations who are very deeply embedded into the Canadian society. And I think that the sensibilities of South Asians and their output uh, for their learning and give, like taking hands and giving hands like that in literature. So she, we will be talking to her about uh, all that. Subharta ji has credit of 27 books with him, 29 books, I apologize. My numbers are very bad, I think. <laughs> you have your huge contribution, I feel like, because uh, right now we are living in a world where we need to interact with different languages of South Asia, because the intellectual process which is happening in different parts of the world is actually contributing a lot in our uh, right now the world we are living in which is very global so and you are a technical person also with that so i'm sure that you have a lot to talk to about the new sensibilities of the literature and how to be connective with that so we will uh, we will start uh, with all those things so hamara jo jo hamara basic point hai aaj ka wo hai canadian landscape for south asia writers so I am going to ask this question anyone can answer all of you can answer that how would you like to comment on Canadian landscape and South Asian writers so when I uh, look at uh, literary world um, I always look at the contributions that uh, artists make towards the betterment of society so from that perspective, if we look at the South Asian uh, communities' struggle in Canada, we look at some of the emerging challenges that have happened in the past and that are continuing to arise. So for example, in, uh, in, in the South Asian community, we are still struggling with health issues within our own community. We are um, uh, trying to understand the complexities why our youngsters are not getting married. So when I'm as a as a as a uh, marriage counselor, when people come to me, parents come to me and say, "Yara paise lelo te asade bache nu ko bhi We are not trained in this thing. So <clears throat> I'm just saying that uh, when we look at these contemporary problems. That is what I think the artists need to look at. How are we going to educate the South Asian community and mass around the new complexities that are arising in the Canadian landscape? The other thing that <clears throat> I have struggled uh, uh, since 1968 when I came to Canada is that do we really understand how systemic racism affects the South Asian community? 
do we understand it do we understand the divisions within the south asian community that exists and are becoming polarized that i as a sikh um, uh, person cannot criticize anything within the muslim community or within the hindu community that people will get upset about it and they will call me khalistani just because uh, i am criticizing something that i find it shouldn't be done i think those are the complexities that we need to really look at if we want to as a south asian really want to uh, uh, develop a cohesiveness within our own diaspora i think that within each community there is an element of good as as writers and as artists we can definitely we can uh, uh, make some positive contributions but if there is something that is not so right do we are we at the liberty now to criticize it or are we going to ostracize because we have taken a stand which it doesn't conform for example <clears throat> uh, let me give you an, there aren't that many writers that have critiqued the use of religion uh, within our community towards uh, uh, um, uh, um, towards a certain end which may be problematic and so if you criticized you get not only attacked by the uh, uh, militant uh, aspects within each of these community but you are also attacked by everybody else as well rather than looking at a problem so within the canadian diaspora so we have these emerging issues that are emerging and i think that uh, uh, within the uh, broad spectrum of the literary world uh, we need to be able to look at these different issues that are emerging and as artists writers poets uh, people who engage in drama or visual artistry uh, they should be able to take a look at these and say okay we have these emerging issues how can we make a positive contributions towards building a cohesive south asian community and if there are dissensions within the south asian community can we remain civil i i can i can have the right to disagree but in a respectful manner and i think that respect we can talk about how that respect can be maintained in 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 some but i think those were some of my opening remarks and then we can engage in discussion in some more about it i would like to listen about this the same question from both of you also because i think everybody has their own perspective to see how they want to see right so anuva ji please so first of all i have to thank baldev ji just to let you know i've worked with him for 25 years now we started at grassroots in that little okasi room if you remember and we started navigating all the webs of how to move forward with our equity diversity work 25 years ago it was a very different canada and um what he says i'm completely in alignment with that except that i'm going to give another filter or from the author or a lit point of view So I'll give you an example. Four years ago, when I uh, used to present on stage, I was often, and I always dreaded this question. I knew it would come at the end of every um, stage speaking engagement. I was called aside and said, "Are you a Canadian writer? Are you an Indian writer?" And I used to be very infuriated because I am just a writer. Period. And I have multiple identities. And to answer their question, I used to say Indo-Canadian. today when i present nobody asks me this question it's taken for granted that i'm indo canadian i think this in itself is a progression that we need to record these micro progressions we need to record because we have moved forward in the past 5 years despite all our dissonance and um, there was almost an award for diasporic dissonance i think we should have we are so diverse i don't even know how south asian as a label would ever apply to us they just need to club us together by they i mean the other for their understanding for statistical purposes otherwise we belong to different heritages lineages backgrounds traditions ethnicities so 
My one thing is I think we are standing today on crossroads. I spoke about it a little bit yesterday. I want to elaborate on that. I think the post-COVID world is very different. I think we have an opportunity today to move forward as a community. What that community means is what we need to do is create a safe space to add to what Baldev Ji said, to have those kind of dialogues, to have those kind of discussions and discourses on what that community means. But together we need to come as a community and move forward. And it's almost like going and reclaiming some space in today's Canadian landscape. It's almost like reclaiming your heritage in Canada. We are building our history and our heritage in Canada as we speak. I think one of the answers that comes, and it's only one, is from literature, from my point of view, is from storytelling. And again, I touched upon this yesterday. Storytelling in itself is much larger a form than the written word. We are natural storytellers. We all have stories in us. We were born out of stories. And we, throughout our life, look for stories. So storytelling, whether it's our mythology, our folklore, our um, rhymes, our um, even diasporic writing, our um, secular writing, wherever our stories come from, that is the place where we should crave and dig for our identity. And that identity, again, can be very diverse. And that is the foundation we all should stand on. So, and the last point I, I'm trying to make here is, there are two things I'm saying. It's time to reclaim and redefine who we are as a community. And with that, it's time to then go and make our space in the larger Canadian diasporic identity. Thank you. The thing that uh, she was telling uh, regarding our identity, and uh, Tahirji was speaking about it in his last evening's speech that what is Canadian literature? He was saying that Canadian literature is not the literature that are written in English and French. Rather, he proposed that all the languages that we are using as our, uh, as our medium for expressing our literature should be considered as Canadian literature if the writer is in Canada. So if, even if I write in Bengali, even if she writes in Hindi or Urdu, that should be considered as Canadian literature. As Canadian landscape for South Asian literature or South Asian writers, I want to uh, rephrase the uh, question as a Canadian landscape for Bengali writers, Canadian landscape for Urdu writers, or even it could be or, uh, for an Italian writer or Nepalese writer, the answer will be same. Because whenever a writer, like all other immigrants, immigrates to Canada, the challenges are almost the same. And the thing is that whenever we actually want to make a creation in our words, then we have to be immersed into the new society, new land, new people, and the new history, the history of the land that we are living uh, now. So if we ca cannot emerge ourselves with the new society, new culture, then we cannot create a, a, a literature that will be out of this society. But we can understand that what happens with the people when we write, we, we, we can take, we can set our things, set the plots of our novels or poetry in Canada or outside Canada. We will see, if we go through the history of the Canlit, we will see that there have been many writers, tens of hundreds of writers, who have used the, uh, uh, the settings of their back home in their literature, and those books have been appraised hugely 
praised in Canada also. And here, the most positive thing is that Canada all the time welcomes this sort of writings also. So whatever we write in English, in French, in other languages, that will be Canadian, no problem. Thank you. So you have uh, very well said that when we are very well um, embedded in the society, then we write about that. So literature it has a lot to do with your context where you're living in. And when it starts showing in your language, that means that your sensibilities are according to the contemporary world you're living in. Coming to my point is that how do any one of you is more than welcome or all of you can answer that how do you see the new literature uh, new literary sensitivities towards and sensibilities towards the South Asians and how do you see that what is required or are we at the place where we can say that yes it's the time to know us through us or how would you comment on that? So I would go back into my bilingual comment, my dualism, my Indo-Canadianism. And I think the answer for me lies there. Um, just because I belong to my Indian heritage, or I'm of that heritage, does not mean that I have to write about just India and its themes, the glorified past. I live here, my life is here. For more than a quarter of a century, I've lived in Canada. So yes, while my stories may come and go from India, but to classify me in a box, and by, by classifying I mean if I go to publish my book, I'm often not given a break in the mainstream, so to say, because I belong to this heritage. Oh, you're from India? So okay, your themes have to be from there. My creativity, my freedom of expression, my thought, my imagination, my myth, my magic, that's Canadian, because that is real, and that's what I live today. So what, to answer your question, what's happening in contemporary literature writing for the South Asians, I think they are trying very hard, like me, to break out of that mold. It will take time. It will take forums like this to come together to define who we are, our identity, our foundation. And once we've done that, we will be getting more breaks in the mainstream. So why is the mainstream important? Because it speaks to everybody. And that brings me to a very larger question of what is Canada? It's not English and French anymore. After 1960s, the profile of immigrants that have started coming in are professional class. They're no longer from Europe. After Trudeau opened the racial ban, with that comes in a lot of international intellect, intelligence, wealth, money. And if Canada does not record that, and much of that is from South Asia, then we lose out. So I think for literature to get a break, this is a small part of the larger break that our community needs as a whole. Uh, I think the, uh, in my conversation with Rupi Kaur, uh, my daughter uh, is the manager for Rupi Kaur, so I had the opportunity to sit with her, and it was an interesting insight when I had some discussions with her. She says, I had to, when I was struggling to be a poet, I had this dual fight within myself. On the one hand, I wanted to establish within the South Asian community as a writer and a poet. On the other hand, I wanted myself to be accepted by the mainstream. So she said, I, uh, so for, for a long time, she said, in, in my own self, I was struggling. Okay, should I even write this world in my poetry? Would it be accepted by mainstream? Would it be published? Or should I just be true to myself? This is my poetry. I'm going to write it, whether it's accepted or not. So I think this, this whole idea uh, is, is very deeply ingrained in the, in the South Asian community. So who's going to pick up the book? Who's going to publish it? Will it be, and she was lucky that through uh, their own struggle uh, uh, to establish her identity, that she, her book became the new, on the New York's bestseller uh, list as a, as a, uh, as a uh, poet. And then she subsequently traveled and, and, and got the fame that she, she so well deserved. But her struggle still is 
ਪੈਨ ਵਿੱਚ ਅਨੁਬਾਦੀ ਸੈਡ ਇਸ਼ੀ ਏ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਪੋਇਟ ਇਸ਼ੀ ਏ ਸਾਊਥ ਏਸ਼ੀਅਨ ਪੋਇਟ ਇਸ਼ੀ ਏ ਕੈਨੇਡੀਅਨ ਪੋਇਟ ਔਰ ਇਸ਼ੀ ਜਸਟ ਏ ਪੋਇਟ ਸੋ ਸ਼ੀ ਆਫਨ ਗੈਟ ਸੋ ਵੈਨ ਸ਼ੀ ਗੋਸ ਟੂ ਦੁਬਈ ਫਾਰ ਐਗਜ਼ਾਮਪਲ ਇਟਸ ਇੰਟਰਸਟਿੰਗ ਦੈਟ ਸ਼ੀ ਇਜ਼ ਇੰਟਰੋਡਿਊਸਡ ਫਰਮ ਏ ਪੋਇਟ ਹੂ ਇਜ਼ ਹਰ origignal origins are from india she comes and uh, grew up in canada and now she is performing in dubai <clears throat> a interesting way of no introducing a poet who is a poet i think those are some of the challenges that we need to really synthesize break out are we just poets writers or are we south asian poets and writers and when do we use it interchangeably do we use it when it benefits us because that's what the society says those are some complexities that i think the younger generation is kind of no dissecting so if you look at for example uh, you guys must have heard the song brown monday so you look at it it's being played all across canada it's not just a punjabi you know youngsters singing the song it's been in everyone and even even the mainstream community is saying hey do you have you heard about the song brown monday those are i think now the younger generation will be looking at purely what uh, uh, both uh, 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 panelists have told so eloquently are we just poets and writers and artists or are we south asian poets and artists or are we breaking it down further are we bengali punjabi hindi urdu those writers i think those are some emerging challenges that are emerging within the south asian community and i hope that uh, uh, through through discussions this will uh, come about how the world has changed so how it has affected uh, to reach to the people or the understanding of the literary work anybody can answer everybody can answer so what would what would be your input intake for that how technology is helping or not helping basically it seems to me that uh, during the covid actually we people who had been staying at home we had uh, developed a sort of expertise in technologies and for that very reason if it is for myself i would say i also uh, work for a bengali community television nrb and during the covid i had done more than 100 live tv shows and before that we didn't know that okay it is a book on my it's a program on my book suppose this is my book on canadian literature in bengali so it was when we had such an event before the covid it was attended by 100 or 150 people but during the covid we learned that if we do it uh, live if we use the facebook live along with the television live then it can reach very easily um, hundreds of uh, thousands of people the readers so it has been easier for the writers to reach the readers who are who had been beyond our periphery before and who are now in our grip i should say so and what is any put output you want to put in i uh, i've stopped saying wonderful to meet you when i write my email of thank yous i have always say how nice to e meet you that e meet you has become so standard now it's for so i think it's technology is a means for me it's not an end and reading is a dying art our next generation barely reads and they're overstimulated with technology so i think our responsibility is how to hone responsibly uh, where and what text they take in visually from uh, from um, social media it's a devil but it can be very useful to disseminate our messages if we hone them properly if we navigate them properly I think there is no substitute to technology there's no substitute to social media but yet on a note what feeds technology there'll still be books and texts that need to feed what you broadcast i'm hoping i'm hoping producers don't become authors 
I'm hoping producers still need authors to broadcast their shows. So that's my hope. But as far as expecting these books to be sold, especially by the young gener to the young generation, I'm not so sure if that's going to happen. Unless we make e-books, we make podcasts, we make um, audio um, Kindle and those would. So even I don't have time to, when I'm driving home from work, then I listen to podcasts. It's just the way the world is and COVID has sharpened technology to such a limit that there is no turning back. Uh, I think that uh, um, uh, the technology also um, brings new challenges, which I think that the writers and artists need to kind of you know, educate the South Asian community on. For example, during COVID, we learned, um, because I was the CEO uh, until July this year of Punjabi Community Health Services, so we had a dramatic increase in young people addicted to video games. So within the two year span, we had a large number of young people coming to us uh, for uh, uh, video games as well. So uh, all of a sudden within the community, uh, there is a, a big push that, okay, uh, how do we uh, make a proper use of the technology that we have? That's one. The second thing, I think the bigger debate in the entire world is around artificial intelligence. I don't know how many of you have used uh, chat GBT, but if you write uh, uh, in chat GBT, uh, you say, um, in Punjabi, please write a poem about Heer Ranja from Punjab, India. And it will give you a poem in Punjabi, actually in, in Gurmukhi script, uh, and it will write a poem in there. So my question is, um, are we uh, 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 having the same kind of you know, concerns which many of the thinkers uh, all across the world are having, that the technology is becoming intelligent and it is becoming very, very intelligent, but what will happen if this technology, this, this intelligence turns into consciousness? So if the technology develops its own consciousness, would we be able to stop it? And I think that is the concern that we as writers and artists and, uh, and, and other thinkers need to look at this critically. Uh, what is the South Asian writers and within our community, what is the level of discussion around artificial intelligence and its use and misuse uh, within our own community? Uh, the other questions around uh, the use of technology uh, is there is much more evidence uh, now that is coming across the entire world that the young people are much more interested in getting married to their cell phones rather than to human beings. So the question that the, the writers and artists need to bring is Okay, if everyone, both the young men and young women, get married to their cell phones, then what will happen to the world? In Canada, we have 1.4 children per couple. In order to sustain Canada, we need 2.1 children per couple. So we are behind. Japan has 0 0.9 children per couple. So has Korea, uh, 1.2. Uh, children per couple in Russia, 1.2 children per couple in China. So all these civilizations are um, uh, going through a deep turmoil. Is this a concern for South Asian writers and thinkers? Are we concerned about it? Are we not concerned about it? So I think those are some complexities of technology that we as South Asian writers should look at and see what our future holds for us. And I think that is the new trend for youngsters who are emerging writers, artists, and poets to talk about, think about, discuss around the artificial intelligence as well. Can I Thank add you. one uh, point? Yes. Uh, the thing is that... Go ahead. Uh, what Sarah was saying that uh, uh, regarding uh, Chad GPT, Chad GPT can write a poem, yes. And the scientists have invented that. We cannot ignore that there is Chad GPT and it can write a very good poem on Bengali thoughts as he was referring to 
Punjabi thoughts, Punjabi culture, Punjabi society. In that case, we have to bring out a new idea how we can come out that of that. We cannot ignore what the scientists have invented. We have to accommodate with that and we have to bring out a new idea, new way out from that, I think. Okay. I think it's more than accommodate. I think we need to take charge of this new community that's coming up, our technological community, our e-community. If we don't um, take it into our consideration. All we've been talking about right now, South Asian community, it's not the physical community anymore. It's also the e-community, which includes the next generation. And maybe that is the disconnect right now in our community itself, because we do not take into, like Baldevji said, in artificial intelligence. India, as we speak, has done some phenomenal things with artificial intelligence. I'm not very convinced that all those things are very responsible, but they are still way ahead of Canada. So this is again an opportunity for us to come because I think South Asians are very technologically savvy as a race. So that's an opportunity in itself. So especially we are discussing in perspective of literature also that how to communicate through the literature also. So we have to find out the means to communicate better in the contemporary world. So the, another uh, thing which uh, thought is universal. It has no uh, race, color or anything. So I would ask all of you to answer however you want to that how do you see South Asian literature and its thought process uh, uh, in contemporary global world? That's a very <laughs> nice question and a very difficult question. It is layered. Nice as well as difficult. Uh, it's, it's difficult and it's very layered and whatever I'll try to attempt to answer is only going to scratch the surface. It's okay. Let's I think start. because we are an old civilization, for me, my answers always lie in our history and mythology. And how we reinvent the consciousness of those stories to make them real today, to make sense of our life today. Otherwise, for me, history, mythology, traditions have no meaning. I'm talking personal. If, if these things that I am a part of, my heritage, cannot help me today with my issues, then I'm not going to do idol worship. I'm not going to sit in a temple, mosque, gurudwara and pray to a God that I don't know about. Does that kind of make sense? So that is my opinion about what do I... Sorry, what was your question? Can you say it again? <laughs> I said the thought is universal. Yes. It has no boundaries, it has no gender, it has no color. And where do you see... But the counter question is, is there really any individual th thought process for the South Asian people? I don't think so. Oh, I see what you're asking. I get it. So for me, myth, magic and uh, reality, they're all mixed. Imagination. These have no geographical boundaries. Just like isms and issues don't have geographical boundaries. They just mutate and take different forms across continents and they submerge themselves, very camouflage themselves in the cultures where they live. The same way, we South Asians have a whole treasure, a repository to dig into, to build our myth, magic and our memories, the three M's of literature. And when she was uh, telling about a myth, I was wondering, you see, when a myth goes to a person who is not associated with that society or history, it can give a new interpretation to them. Suppose we are the nations, if it is South Asian, who does have the, uh, what should I say, uh, the richest uh, heritage of mythology. Our Ravana does have 10 heads and that should be considered as the best example of uh, magic realism which 
our writers thought of 5,000 years before. Uh, 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 just to build on what uh, uh, both panelists have, have said, uh, uh, I, I think that we have some basic uh, um, uh, universal values within the Indian subcontinent, and one of it is, is accepting of diversity. I think that those are the foundations on which I think the, uh, the, the civilizations can be built. Are we able to accept diversity? Uh, to what extent are we uh, uh, accepting them? What are their uh, humanist values that uh, the civilizations espouse? And I think in the, the subsequent generations are looking at it. So if we look at, for example, the Indo-Canadian community in Canada and their struggles uh, to uh, be accepted uh, on par with the mainstream community, I think all those struggles have basically that we wanted to participate, that we wanted to build Canada, that we, we, our successive generation should be uh, accepted on par with the Canadian society. All those values and, and our, our uh, um, uh, kind of you know, struggles, our historical um, uh, contributions to the entire world, I think those are the foundation stones that the successive generations can build on. So from that thought processes, I think, the, the whole ability for us to unite, the whole ability for us to look at how can we make a positive contributions in Canada or, or no across the world, uh, what does it say? It gives, I think, if you look at, uh, I mean, if you just browse YouTube, the uh, the immense kind of you no know, contributions of you no know, uh, 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 individuals from the Indian subcontinent, whether they are the CEOs of the multinational corporations, or whether they have set up their own businesses, or whether they have you no know, uh, contributed immensely in the academia field or in, in whatever field they have, it gives us an enormous amount of joy that as the South Asians uh, that we have participated in building this part of the world as well. And I think that is what we need to be more reflected within, the, uh, uh, within our own communities and our own uh, struggles to build here. That, that's what I would kind of know, say as well. Freedom of speech and creative process. They are very, very big questions your input, where do we stand, where do Canada stand, where do uh, other uh, uh, people around us stand, where the globe is standing, your input please, one after another. Um, just briefly, I think, uh, um, I just want to uh, just briefly talk about it. I think freedom of speech, uh, I think we should have a lot more tolerance to the diversity of opinion that exists. I think yesterday when I was hearing um, uh, uh, the gentleman who spoke eloquently around uh, people uh, whose main mission is to open uh, Twitter or, 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 or YouTube and, uh, or, or Facebook and become angry and raged at it. And I think that is much more that I am concerned about, that as a human being that I cannot even express myself in a decent manner. And I think for me, that is, a, that is what worries me, is that we are not even engaged in civilized conversations about diversity of opinion. And I think that is what worries me uh, a great deal about which way are we heading towards intolerance and uh, uh, stopping the other person from even expressing themselves. And, and it's very problematic within the many uh, uh, circles as well. And to the uh, extent that it has also now started to creep in academia, where academia was uh, supposed to be where diversity of opinions and different diversity existed. And um, so that, that kind of you know, worries me as well. I think I'm going to answer it at two levels. The first is the literature level. It's freedom of free speech and expression from a, as an author, I think it's, um, I think Canada does a very good job in that as long as we are uh, within the human rights at a um, strategic level and we are not openly attacking sensibilities of another community, I think authors and writers have freedom of speech and expression in Canada. So that's, I've personally experienced it. The problem is not that. The problem is the dissemination of your message 
where does it go and who does it land up with? That is where I have a problem. We are confined to preordained boxes of what we should be ex expectations of what we should write about and why we should do it because we belong to a certain ethnocultural group or a certain sensibility. That is where I have a problem. The other message, the second message is at a societal level, again, to build on Baldev Ji's uh, thought. We'd spoken about it earlier. The community safe space that we are talking about building through forums like this, I think that is the spot where tolerance is going to take its seeds. And that's why I feel forums like these are very important because they start these dialogues, they start the thinking, and everything starts in the head. And then it goes forward. So I think the community building safe spaces, and whether the, where you have to give an award in diasporic dissonance, I don't care, do it. But at least have a safe conversation about our differences, our tolerance, and our levels of tolerance. Not everything that comes out of my mouth is supposed to be politically incorrect. I should have the space and the freedom to say what I want to say without hurting anybody, but without also blaming me that I've hurt other people's sensibilities when I, that is not my intention or that is not what I have said. So. The point is without hurting anybody. That is very important. Yesterday in the evening uh, when the gala party was going on, the one speaker was uh, talking about his podcast and he was saying that the title of his podcast was Charbaka. If we go to Charbaka, who was Charbaka? Charbaka was the person who actually didn't believe in God. And Lord Rama, in the Ramayana, we see that Lord Rama, he had to go, he would go to Charbaka, the wise person, to know about many things. Lord Rama would make questions to the person and he would try to satis satisfy, satiate Lord Rama's thirst for knowledge. There's a very good uh, example in it, that is, one is God himself, we believe, and the other is who doesn't believe in God. And there was the combination of it in our literature, in our heritage. So, there should be freedom of speech. There had been the heritage of freedom of speech in South Asian societies for the last millenniums. With these remarks. I thank you for my panelists today. We can have on and on and on discussion about that, which will never end, but I think it's the time for the next panel. And I would just give a last input in, 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 uh, before we go. Um, I think the intellectuals who have done the work uh, in South Asia had never been recognized as they are recognized today. And we should know that the changing and emerging new world have new sensibilities where we have to understand that the world had always been a round circle and it never cho chose a special place to have special kind of nourishment for the thought process and intellectual work. And I thank you once again. <laughs>